What's going on, family? This is Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff Series. This is part two of the history of Harlem. And in part one, we discussed William Ward, Kid Norfolk. Now, he was born July 10th, 1893 in Norfolk, Virginia. He died April 15th, 1969 in Harlem, New York. He stood 5 foot 10 inches and he weighed 165 to 183 pounds. He was managed by Leo P. Flynn. And we discussed in part one that Leo P. Flynn, manager of Kid Norfolk, had got in touch with Jack Kearns, who was the manager of Jack Dempsey, and offered him an opportunity to face Kid Norfolk. This was in 1918, the year of the Harlem Renaissance. By the way, the Harlem Renaissance was a collaboration of poets and musicians and actors and actresses, some of the finest of its day, that lasted between 1918 and 1930. But in 1918, the offer was rejected. They claimed that they had a shot at George Carpentier of France. And that opportunity never revealed itself until 1921. And Jack Dempsey would have a few fights in between then. And Kid Norfolk had spoke to Leo P. Flynn about the toy bulldog, Mickey Walker, who was also represented by Jack Kearns. And Flynn had offered a letter to Jack Kearns concerning the fight between Kid Norfolk and the toy bulldog, Mickey Walker. And you want to know what the conversation was. Jack Kearns openly told Leo P. Flynn, I can't give you Mickey Walker. When he asked him why not, he told him, because in his contract it states that once Mickey Walker becomes champion, he would never defend his title against a black fighter. Let's stop right there for one moment. I personally saw that contract, a copy of that contract. I had a historian friend. That's what he did. He collected contracts. He showed me that contract of Mickey Walker. It states... No title defenses against the Negro race. I have a great deal of respect for Mickey Walker, one of the greatest fighters of all times. But I can't put Mickey Walker on my greatest pound for pound list. I can't put Jack Dempsey on my greatest pound for pound list. a lot of fighters I can't put there because they never gave a black fighter a shot at a title. And that's just unfortunate. That Kid Norford and Harry Smith, George Godfrey, Neil Clisby, Panama Joe Gans, Baby Joe Gans, they were the second tier of the Black Murders Row. And they didn't get the shots that they deserved. So they had to face one another. And Kid Norfolk would face another Harlemite. And his name was Lee Anderson. You're looking at Lee Anderson. Foot out of Harlem. If you owed the numbers, Sharkies, any money, you could bet the show at 3 o'clock in the morning you get a, a visit from Lee Anderson. Collected the money. Outstanding fighter he was. He was a color light heavyweight champion. Now, Kid Norford with defeat. Many fighters, but he would lose to Alabama Kid and lose his colored heavyweight championship. I'm sorry, colored light heavyweight championship. And he would pick it up after losing to Lee Anderson. He would pick it back up from Lee Anderson. And that was some fight in Harlem. But I just want to touch back on Mickey Walker for one moment. I respect Mickey Walker a great deal as a fighter. 
outstanding fighter. My, my dad knew of him. You see, Mickey Walker had a bar not too far from the old Madison Square Garden. And in that bar was a place to be because you had all four walls full of posing fighters. The only bar that was like that. And a who's who was in Mickey Walker's bar. But he never gave black fighters a shot at the title. Now he won his middleweight championship belt in 26. From Tiger Flowers. And that victory was questioned because Mickey Walker had ties to the mob. More or less, Jack Kearns. Anyone who knows boxing knows what I'm talking about. You question it, you don't understand the game. But back to Lee Anderson, he's an outstanding fighter. And that fight with Kid Norford was a fight that Harlem's residents would never forget. Phenomenal fight that took place between Kid Norford and Lee Anderson. Right now you're looking at a fighter by the name of Harry Smith. When you walked up the flight of steps from 116th Street, you would enter Grubb's Gym. And there would be a trainer there by the name of Nick Scallion, who was a famous trainer and a former fighter, who welcomed and trained Harry Smith, the Harlem Thunderbolt. Born October 28, 1907, in Jamaica, British West Indies. He died September 19, 1933, in Chicago, Illinois. He stood six foot and weighed 158 to 176 pounds. He was managed by Dave Brown. Now, at that time, Harlem was still doing and having problems, repercussions of the war. Harry Smith was a natural southpaw, but he was turned around by his trainer, Nick Scallion, because of his powerful right hand. And Harry Smith didn't need to box. You see, his family wanted him to study and become a dentist. His father was a wealthy man and owned a fleet of taxi cabs in the small Caribbean islands. And in 1910, businesses became slow and his father moved the entire family to New York. Moved them to Harlem, New York. And Harry's father would reestablish his taxi cab company and he would own a fleet of cabs and real estate. He owned half of Harlem at this time. And he even had summer homes that he would rent out. Thanks to Marcus Garvey, who would reestablish the NAACP. And he would establish his shit in New York and gave opportunities the family such as Harry Smith. Now Harry graduated from PS 89 in 1922. That would be the year that Nat Flasher would design the infamous Ring Magazine. It would also be the year that the Pittsburgh Windmill, Harry Greb, would defeat Gene Tunney for the America's Light Heavyweight Championship belt. And he would attend continuation school he wanted to become a mechanical engineer and Harry's father wanted him to become a dentist. And after convincing his father that he wanted to pursue dentistry, but he also wanted to become a fighter. Harry's dad told him straight out, he said, look, either you go to school for college and become a dentist or you will lose all financial support of this family. And Harry would take a small job as a soda jerker and a toy painter. And Harry landed a steward position on the United Foods Liner. He had an argument with a fellow steward about a chip that he claimed was his. And he challenged the man to a fight outside. Now he had no fighting experience at this time, but he had the spirit of the challenger 
and he would step outside and he would take a beating. And it was at this time when he decided to walk around the block to Grubb's gym with a swollen eye and a busted lip. And that's when he would meet Nick Scallion. And little did Nick Scallion know that he was looking at a future amateur star and a colored middleweight champion. You see, Harry Smith had a fighting career record of 60-0 with 55 knockouts as an amateur. He turned down an opportunity to try out for the 1928 Olympic team. After winning the Metropolitan Amateur Tournament in New York Madison Square Garden, the referee was Jack Dempsey. And after raising Harry Smith's hand, Jack Dempsey whispered over to the announcer. He said, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been in this game a long time. And once this young man becomes number one contender, whoever the champion is, is in trouble because this young Negro could fight. Words of Jack Dempsey. He said he hits like a ton of bricks. Harry Smith would win a Canadian inner city middleweight championship by defeating Cliff Gardner and Billy Burns. Now when Harry... Smith retired. He retired a wealthy young man. But before he would retire, he would rack up 90% knockout streak. He would eventually face another Harlem Knight by the name of Jack McVeigh. Jack, Mc Jack McVeigh's name was Julian Williams. Born June 8th, 1905 in Athens, Georgia. He died October 29th, 1975 in Harlem, New York. He stood 5 foot 9 inches and he weighed 147 pounds. He was managed by Maurice Kane. Now Jack McVeigh, one of the better fighters in Harlem at that time. And everyone couldn't wait to see the fight between Harry Smith and Jack McVeigh. And when that fight took place in 1928, it was the most anticipated fight between two outstanding fighters from Harlem. And in the opening rounds, Jack McVeigh would get the better of Harry Smith. He had more experience, better punching power, Although, Harry Smith had a 90% knockout rate. But it wouldn't be till the last round, last two rounds, that Harry Smith would take over and he would defeat Jack McVeigh and become the colored middleweight champion of the world. And he would try to get a shot with Mickey Walker. He was turned down. Tried to get a shot numerous times. Former champions, contenders, Hall of Famers, and he would get turned down. But you're looking at some of the greatest fighters in boxing history. I have Harry Smith, ranked number four. Greatest middleweight champion, although it was for the colored middleweight championship belt. But he couldn't get the fights to prove otherwise. Knocked out the majority of his opponents. Had an amateur pedigree. I believe, have given the opportunity, Harry Greb would have been one of the greatest fighters of all times. When you walked up the steps of Grubb's gym, and you walked down the steps of the Salem Crescent Club, you will hear the sound of a beautiful tap dancing rhythm followed by a skip rope that was off rhythm. The whistling sounds of the rope cutting through the wind. And when you went around a corner and you noticed a young man well-built, 
tall, very athletic. And if you ask someone who that was, they would tell you that he would be the future champion in the lightweight division at that time. And you might be fortunate enough to ask the man who was actually training him. You see, that man was Harry Wiley Sr. And Harry Wiley Sr. would have been talking about Walker Smith, better known as Smitty. And Harry Wiley Sr. was a former postal worker, a YMCA fighter, trained fighters such as Henry Armstrong and Danny Cox, future five time champion, great Sugar Ray Robinson. So after training at the Salem Crescent Club, Walker Smith would train at Grubbs Gym. He would win in 1938 Golden Gloves in Chicago. 1939 and 1940 New York Golden Gloves in featherweight and lightweight division. He would defeat Louis Spider Valentine in the open class Madison Square Garden in 1939. He would defeat Andy Nunau in the open class Golden Gloves, Madison Square Garden in 1940. See, Joe Lewis and Jack Blackburn would visit Grubbs Gym. And they would get lessons from Harry Wiley Sr. Harry Wiley Sr. was honored to be the lead trainer in the 1932 USA boxing team. Now out of eight divisions, Harry Wiley would be responsible for bringing home five medals, two gold and three bronze. And according to studies, no medals has been won for the next 20 years. It wouldn't be until Floyd Patterson would win the gold medal in the middleweight division in the Helsinki Games in Finland. But Harry Wiley Sr. would train fighters such as Danny Cox, Ray Robinson, Louis Spider Valentine, Baby Joe Gans, Henry Armstrong, Canada Lee, Joe Lewis, Kid Chocolate, Lou Ambers, Lou Salica, who was actually on that 1932 Olympic team. He would win a bronze medal under the tutelage Harry Wiley and he would also become a Bantamweight champion after the Olympics Harry Wiley was hit by a taxi cab Henry Armstrong didn't make that 1932 Olympic team but he became a three time world champion and held those belts simultaneously with lessons learned from Harry Wiley Sr. Danny Cox was a very good heavyweight, but when he turned professional, he would face fighters such as Tammy Mariello, who's from the Bronx, Lee Oma, Ted Lowry, Wallace Cross. Got those skills under the tutelage of Harry Wiley Sr. When Harry Wiley Sr. would come back from recovering from his accident, we come back to the gym and become trainer for Medley Jackson. His name was Henry Armstrong. And Harry Wiley Sr. was friends with George Gangford. Gangford knew Harry Armstrong. Henry Armstrong was the manager of Medley Jackson. And the thing is that Julian Black and Jack Blackburn knew each other very well. But Julian Black and George Gangford ran the numbers together in Harlem. And Harry Armstrong and Medley Jackson, they look like brothers. Look like twin brothers. 
But they would eventually move west. Gangsford and Wiley were looking for the next big star. It was a young man that kept coming back and hanging around the gym. And he told Gangsford that he wanted to fight like his idol, Joe Lewis. And Walker Smith used to carry the, the gym bag for Joe Lewis to the gym. You see, Smitty lived one block away from the gym. And he wanted to enter the AAU tournament. And Harry Wiley said, you're qualified, but you're not old enough. You have to be 18 years of age in order to have an AAU card. So Walker Smith quickly thought about a friend of his by the name of Ray Robinson. He used to hang out in the corner. And he told Harry Wiley Sr., you know, I got a friend that trains here, but I don't think he's coming back. Do you have his AAU card? Name is Ray Robinson. He said, yeah, I know Ray, and I've been trying to get him back in the gym. You know him? He said, yes. Looks like he's not coming back. So he thought of a scheme to take the AAU card of Ray Robinson and give it to Walker Smith. And Ray Robinson, as you know him today, was born. And he was given that AAU card and he was involved in tournaments. Got him in the Chicago Golden Gloves and the New York Golden Gloves. He was 15 years old when he started. And that started the history of Ray Robinson. Now they had to get a team together. So Harry Wiley Sr. would become his cornerman in chief second. George Gangford would become his manager. They had a guy by the name of Soldier, Soldier Jones. And they had an assistant by the name of Charlie Pee Wee Beal. My dad knew him. He used to hang out on 118th Street in a tire fixing shop. Always wore suspenders. You see, Sugar Ray Robinson, his name was Walker Smith, he was originally from Alley, Georgia. He would pass through Detroit and wind up in Harlem, New York. Trained at the Salem Crest of Metropolitan Church. In the basement of that church, you got the Salem Crest of Boxing Club. It's on 129th Street, 2190 to be exact, 7th Avenue. Adam Clayton Power. It would be the second room. It is now a kitchen. But Ray Robinson had total bouts of 85. 85 wins. 69 knockouts. 40 knockouts on the very first round as an amateur. As a professional. He would fight fighters such as Paul Pender. Terry Downs. Henry Armstrong. Sammy Engott. Fitzy Zivit. Marty Servo. Izzy Genazzo. Denny Moyer. Rob Dupas. We fight Joey Giardello, Jake LaMotta, Carl Bobo Olsen, Randy Turpin, Gene Former, Carmen Basilio. I mean, these are Hall of, time, Hall of Fame greats, all-time greats. 1999, he was named welterweight and middleweight fighter of the century by the Associated Press. He's a five-time middleweight champion, one-time welterweight champion. He would win a welterweight championship strap in 1946 from Ohio's own Tommy Bell. He would win a middleweight championship strap in 1951 by defeating Jake LaMotta, the Bronx Bull. He lost his first fight with LaMotta in 1943. But three weeks later, he would regain that victory. He would have 40 fights at that time. Also in 43, he would also be in the ring with his idol, Henry Armstrong. You see, he turned professional October 4th, 1940 on the undercard of Henry Armstrong and Fitzy Zivic. And when Zivic took the title away from Armstrong, it wasn't until 1941, the following year, when he stopped Armstrong, when Ray Robinson said, I'm going to get my idol, his revenge. And he would defeat Fitzy Zivic. 
several times. Ray Robinson owned businesses on 124th Street and 7th Avenue. Adam Clayton Power. He owned the Empire Enterprise. Sugar Ray's Real Estate. Sugar Ray's Bar and Grill. Sugar Ray's Laundry. See, his wife, Edna May, also had a shop across the street. Sugar Ray Robinson, greatest pound-for-pound pound fighter in the history of the game. Now, as I stated, Harlem would have some of the greatest musicians, band leaders, poets, politicians, and fighters. But you had historical figures and dignitaries, such as Count Basie, who was a band leader and pianist, along with musician Johnny Hazes, and singer Lena Horne, World heavyweight champion Joe Lewis, as well as actor and singer Paul Robeson. They all lived on 555 Edgecombe Avenue. Stephanie St. Clair, the criminal leader, lived on 409 Edgecombe Avenue. Psychiatric and physician and activist Dr. Clinic Clark lived on 555 Edgecombe Avenue. See, boxer and actor, Canada Lee, also lived in 555 Edgecombe Avenue. Saxophone player, Coleman Hawkins. James Reef, European musician, credited with inventing jazz, lived on 67 West, 133rd Street in Harlem. Gangster Bumpy Johnson, lived in Lenox Terrace, 132nd Street. Frederick Alexander, Birmingham, who was an editor of the Esquire magazine from 1945 to 1957, grew up in Harlem. Louis Satchmo Armstrong, band leader, trumpet player. Langston Hughes, writer. Lionel Hampton, played the drums and the vibes. Billie Holiday, famous singer. She lived with her mother on 108th Street, on 139th Street. You would have great singers, such as Sarah Vaughn, in my opinion, the greatest female singer ever to blow notes. Other greats that passed through Harlem, such as Ella Fitzgerald, and the beautiful Lena Horne, and Josephine Baker. I stated on part one that Ella Fitzgerald started out singing at the Apollo Theater. Opened in 1934 on 125th Street. Frightened young girl, age of 19. Couldn't get her words out. And the words she couldn't get out, she would fill in the gaps by humming and scatting. And with that experience, she would become the greatest scatting singer of all times. She would land a gig with Chick Webb between 140th and 141st Street. It was called the Savoy, Savoy Ballroom. Josephine Baker would be seen in a locker room with three weight division title holder and champion Henry Armstrong at New York's Madison Square Garden. On 118th Street, you could find comedian and actor Milt Burrow and publisher writer Bennett Sheff. Singers Julius Belfort. Equine Carter in New York. Activist writer W.E.B. Du Bois. And painter Aaron Douglas. Both lived in 409 Edgecombe Avenue. Musician and composer, pianist and band leader Duke Ellington. Lived two blocks away from 555 Edgecombe Avenue on Riverside Drive. Coleman Hawkins, one of the greatest saxophone players of all time, also lived 555 Edgecombe Avenue. This is part two of the history of Harlem. 
call him. It's a very, very sacred place. From the Civil War to America's finest entertainers of all walks of life. I'm Scrapbook Boxing. I want to thank you for your time and taking a journey with me through the history of Harlem. All great fights, all great entertainers will never be forgotten right here on the Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff Series. Salute to my subscribers. Salute to Harlem and his greatest humanitarians. <laughs>